Hey everyone, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist, Trent Horn. And today I want to share with you a debate from the archives. Several years ago, I was invited to the University of California in Berkeley to debate Dr. Malcolm Potts on the issue of abortion. So Dr. Potts is an embryologist, he's an abortionist, he helped to make abortion legal in Great Britain in the 1950s and 60s, so he's been involved in this for a long time. And I was grateful that he invited me, that his class invited me to come and debate him. Uh, Stephanie Gray Connors has also debated him on Pints with Aquinas, and so I went there. And yeah, I was just excited that these students at Berkeley were able to hear an alternative view within their medical ethics classroom. So I thought it went very well. It was a cool debate, and I just rediscovered it recently. I shared it with my patrons already at trenhornpodcast.com. And if you want early access to other bonus material, check us out at trenhornpodcast.com as well. So without further ado, here is my debate on abortion with abortionist Malcolm Potts. So the format of the class is we'll have a few little, a few more announcements, and then we'll have Professor Potts discuss the safe abortion stance, and then we'll have Mr. Trent Warren speak on the pro-life stance. I don't like to pose discussions of abortion as a sort of boxing match. So one person's rising there on my floor. I don't see exact kind of debate. What I want to show you are things about how we should deal um, with a very important and difficult issue, and how we reduce human suffering to the greatest extent, and what are the facts that we have available on this topic, and what are the different beliefs uh, that, that people have. When I was a young obstetrician in England, abortion was illegal. So I saw the suffering and the inequity which illegal abortion brought about. And I fought very hard with a small group of people to change the British abortion law, and we did that. And that led to changes here and in Colorado and other places. And so trying to reduce the human suffering, which I've seen associated with abortion, has been a very strong theme in my own life. As far as I know, I am the only physician who has a PhD in embryology and has also done abortions. So I'm very clear about what it is that I have destroyed. Fact number one is that abortion is a remarkably common event. One in three of the women in this room will have an abortion during their lifetime. That's the current prevalence. And at a world level, approximately every woman, on average, will have one induced abortion. Now, that's an average. When I was looking after women in England when abortion was illegal, I had one woman, I said to, to those obstetricians, how many children she had? She said, two. I said, how many abortions have you had? She said, 13. And I looked a bit surprised, which you're not supposed to do. And she volunteered, it's my friend down the road what syringes me up, doctor. That was a common way to do an unsafe abortion. But there, and Russia, people have very high numbers of abortion because contraceptives aren't available. The next point, and this is very important, making abortion illegal does not reduce the number of abortions taking place. And I want to show this from a very interesting epidemiological scientific study from New York. New York State changed its abortion law before Roe v. Wade, which was the Supreme Court ruling which made abortion available in all the country. So before that change, in 1969, certainly did, um, there were this number of births in the state and this number of recorded state abortions. The next year, after the law was changed, the number of births went down and the number of abortions jumped up. So were those new abortions or had there been a lot of unsafe abortions here? And we can answer that uh, question with the uh, next uh, one. So, if we look here, there's a fall in the number of abortions, but there's a rise in the number of safe abortions. But the rise in the number of safe abortions is much more than the fall in the number of births. So, have there been some abortions that would not have otherwise taken place? Well, we can solve that by the next year's statistics, where there's a little fall in the number of births and a very minor rise in the number of legal abortions. So that demonstrates to us that, first of all, here are a lot of unsafe abortions. 
and that when abortion was legal, people were actually using contraceptives better because there wouldn't have been this quite big fall in the number of births and a small rise in the number of abortions if people weren't always using abortions, well, also using contraceptives better. So this is uh, hard uh, data. Another um, work, a terrible natural experiment took place in Romania. A very cruel, evil dictator, Nicolae Ceausescu, in 1966, made abortion, which had previously been legal, this was a communist country, illegal. And he made contraception illegal. This gray area is the total fertility rate. That is the average number of pregnancies a woman has. Six months after this change, the birth rate, the number of pregnancies, doubled because it's suddenly taken contraception and abortion away. But then, slowly, women struggled to go back to where they were before and have fewer children. But now they had to do this with unsafe abortions. And the maternal mortality rate due to abortions went through the sky. Romania came the country in Europe with the highest maternal mortality rate. Then, when the uh, Berlin Wall fell, the Romanians killed Ceausescu. I understand why, because they hated him. And within 48 hours, they changed the abortion law because it had so much suffering. This was also the time when the orphanages filled up with abandoned children. Those children are still suffering. They're never able to develop. They were totally neglected. And they began to count the number of abortions. And the number of abortions was quite high. It jumped from here. And this was replacing unsafe abortions. But very rapidly, the number of abortions came down. The maternal mortality rate came down. And why was that? Well, it was because people had contraceptive choices. These bars are the prevalence of contraception, the, the percentage rate of women using contraception. And they went back to the two children, or fewer than two children, which they had to begin with. So if you make abortion illegal, you kill a lot of women. You don't have any fewer abortions. The biggest difference that I know of in public health, the middle difference in vital statistics, the biggest in equity, is the difference between safe and unsafe abortions. Safe abortion has a death rate of about 1 in 200,000 if done in the first three months of pregnancy. Where I work in Africa, women having an unsafe abortion um, have almost a, a 1 in 100 chance of dying. In Africa, there are 6 million unsafe abortions every year. About 26,000 of those women die. I have just walked across the campus. And every time I walk across the campus, I think of that statistic. Because there are approximately 26,000 male and female students on this campus. So every year, every year, as many people as you can see on this campus in Africa, as many women, basically often young women of your age, die because they are forced to have unsafe abortions. So if we look at this, a very strong correlation between the percentage of women using multiple methods of contraception and a low abortion rate. And that, I think, is something to be welcomed. And that's how you have fewer abortions. My research was on the implantation of the mammalian embryo. This is a mammalian egg, about, um, oh, about 40 hours after fertilization, literally on the top of a needle. No embryologists on this planet could tell the difference between that um, set of cells and the human cells, all exactly the same. My study was how they implanted into the uterus. Some people w would say that that is a person and it deserves the legal and uh, ethical rights that go with a person. Other people have a different point of view. There are different views in this room and they will be talking about that. My point is that there are no absolutes in biology. 
So if it did an eye clicker thing, I'd probably get a different answer here between you, whether, whether that is a person or not. But is that a, a person? Is this a person? I think it's a person. I think it's a lovely, much-loved baby. But as an obstetrician, I would have been sued if I had not aborted that baby. And every obstetrician, Catholic, Muslim, Mormon, anything else, would have aborted that baby. There were no absolutes. That's because the baby was not in the womb, but was an ectopic pregnancy. Most ectopic pregnancies lead to bleeding and threaten the woman's life. That's why they're always 100% removed. And if you didn't remove them, you'd be negligent and probably go to prison quite deservedly. But one in a thousand ectopic pregnancies goes undiagnosed. And this one went undiagnosed. And there's the MRI study of that baby bill. And um, so here is the uterus pushed, in the, um, pushed to one side, totally empty. Here are the limbs and the head of the baby. Uh, here is the woman's bowel. It was an ectopic pregnancy. So there are no absolutes. A molar pregnancy is a result of normal sexual intercourse, uh, but they're always aborted. It is genetically unique, but there's no embryo. It is just placenta. If we look at early uh, mammalian eggs and human eggs, as looked at here, then we find a lot of abnormalities. And in fact, about 15% of women that recognize pregnancy from a late period will have a, a spontaneous miscarriage, a spontaneous abortion. Probably about a third of the eggs that are fertilized are destroyed by natural processes before the first pre pregnancies, before the first periods even miss. So making a human being is not like making an Toyota car. You don't put in a blueprint and a perfect individual comes out. It's a very massive, inaccurate process. And spontaneous abortion is a natural, necessary healing part of that process, without which I think no woman would ever wish to get pregnant, because you're about a third of your babies would be seriously abnormal, with no legs and two heads and everything wrong with them you can possibly imagine. Sometimes, you do abortions as a doctor because a woman, for instance, has a Down syndrome and wishes to have it ended. And that's a good example of a genetic abnormality, which is usually spontaneously aborted, but sometimes isn't. And so it seems to me ethical as a doctor to offer to do what nature sort of failed to do. Just as if you get a, a pneumonia and your antibodies don't work, I will give you an antibiotic. That is an ethical and necessary thing to do. And to me, they're absolutely parallel. So the issue is, I think quite genuinely, when does life begin? And I think there can be many differences on that. The, probably the foremost uh, uh, Catholic theologian of the 20th century, I always regret I had the chance, and I knew a good Catholic theologian, I really should have met him, Bernard Herring, said the moment of installment, when life begins, in the fullest sense of the beginning of a human person, does not belong to the data of revelation. That's a very true fact. I know a lot about embryos, but I cannot tell you when life begins, and I cannot provide convincing evidence when it does begin and when it doesn't begin. I can make a judgment, and I can share that judgment with you, because I've had to use that judgment in my medical practice. It's very important to recognize that Roe v. Wade does not say abortion's right or wrong. It says when those trained in medicine and theology are unable to arrive at a consensus of when life begins, it's not the role of the judiciary to reply. That's a very profound philosophical statement, and it's a very, very important one. And to overthrow Roe v. Wade would be to turn our back on 200 years of religious toleration. I see life as a continuous process, and we have to make uh, pragmatic and sometimes arbitrary di divisions. And the best way to look at this is in the non-emotional world, or fairly non-emotional world, of life after birth. We set different times when you can vote, when you can drive, when you can marry, when you can buy a handgun if you're stupid enough to want it. And those are all arbitrary decisions. But we know that to exclude the extremes. And I see the same thing in development before birth. I think to call a blastocyst a person, in my personal opinion, it is 
silly, or to say using an intruder arm device is poorly fashioned. It's not difficult to distinguish between the blastocyst, which I spent thousands of hours studying on an electron microscope, from a newborn baby. You can do that, I can do that. Where we make the arbitrary decision as life's begin is a matter of judgment. It's an important judgment. It's one that we have to make. This is a beautiful picture from the National Gallery in London by Crivelli. And it tells you a lot about uh, the way in which a lot of people have thought about when life begins. It is the Annunciation when the angels are telling the Virgin Mary that she's pregnant. And if you look very carefully, you can see this sort of laser beam coming down from heaven with a very convenient little door here and a dove. The dove symbolizes uh, the soul in this particular picture. So we talk about here is people trying to struggle with the fact that when, when does life begin, whether it's the life within the Virgin Mary or the life that um, we bring about as men or our wives and loved ones will carry. So I see laws about abortion as matters of religious toleration. They're defined by the First Amendment. And this was superbly sort of reinforced in Vatican II by the institute called uh, Dignitatis Humanae, which says that all persons have a right to religious liberty. This is the teaching of the Catholic Church at Vatican II. The right which is the foundation and in a sense of dignity of each human being. Whether it's the protesters out there about uh, raising fees or president of the university saying we want to raise them. Those are opinions which we need to discuss, which we can battle over, but we do it in a respectful way, in a nonviolent way. All persons must be free to seek the truth without coercion. So for me, abortion, because there is no and never will be a consensus on where life begins, because that's sort of a scientific question. You can no more ask me as an embryologist as when life begins, as you could ask me to prove whether heaven, as you could do if you ask an astronomer to tell you whether heaven is found into a telescope in 30 days. You all know that would be a stupid thing to do, because it's philosophically a stupid thing to do. And asking each other when life begins to prove it is a stupid thing to do. And so we'll always have that diversity and we have to allow for that diversity and respect it. So my personal judgment, and I have an obligation to so share that with you as our second speaker with, I have had the privilege of caring for many women in different parts of the world. I have enormous respect for women and for pregnant women. I've never met a woman who's been frivolous about the need for abortion. I've met women in tears. I've seen women die from unsafe abortions. And I think women deserve whatever information and care they need to make a thoughtful and sincere decision. And society, in my opinion, must respect that decision and extend empathy and support, whether the woman wishes to keep the pregnancy or end it. And therefore, in my book, to make abortion illegal is a philosophical and ethical disaster. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul. So we'll have Mr. Horn now talk about the pro-life stance. So please welcome Mr. Horn. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Potts, for that opening statement. And let me start by saying that I agree with him that abortion is a difficult and emotional issue for many people. Let me tell you a story to explain why it's so difficult. I once was in the lobby of a pregnancy resource center. These are places that help women give birth to their children and then raise them or place them for adoption. There was this sarcastic girl sitting next to me uh, you know, her, in the waiting room. Her hair was dyed a bunch of different colors, like a crayon box that exploded into it. And she asked me, we we're both sitting there, so are you pregnant too? I said, well, no, but what brought you here? She said, well, I was at an abortion clinic waiting for my turn, but then I changed my mind and I said I wanted to keep my baby. Uh, they, and they said the best place to go for that would be one of these pregnancy centers. And I asked her, well, I'm curious, what made you change your mind? And she said, well, inside the lobby, there were lots of women waiting, but nobody was talking. It was 
eerily quiet. The only noise she could hear was the crying and the sobbing in the room where they were doing the abortion. She said, I left because of the screams. Now, this woman wasn't screaming because she was being butchered. I mean, this was a modern Planned Parenthood facility. But why was she so upset? What is it about abortion that just makes some people really upset? Now, a lot of you listening probably say, well, I get why it upsets people. That's why I'm not pro-abortion. I'm pro-choice. You should just be able to have the choice. I'm not pro-abortion. But here's my question for you. What's wrong with being pro-abortion? I mean, if the thing being aborted is not a human being, then abortion, it really isn't a big deal. But if the thing being aborted is a human being, with the same basic rights you and I possess, then abortion is a serious injustice, because abortion involves the direct killing of innocent human beings who have the same value that you and I possess. This is my argument for abortion I'd like to present to you all tonight. Can everyone I would see that? Here's my argument. One, is prima facie wrong to directly kill innocent human beings, and such killing should be illegal. Unborn humans are innocent human beings. Three, abortion directly kills unborn humans. And four, therefore, is prima facie wrong to abort unborn humans and such killing should be illegal. Now let's examine the evidence for each premise of my argument. So premise one, uh, I think this is pretty sound. By prima facie, I mean on the face of it. There may be cases where we must act in a way where innocent human beings will be killed uh, but we do this not intending to kill them, but knowing it will happen. For example, if we shoot down an airplane that's going to fly into a building, or as Dr. Potts mentioned, remove an ectopic pregnancy from a woman's uterus. What we do here is we don't intentionally kill an innocent human being. We act in a way to save as many humans as we can, because if we did nothing, more people would die. But that doesn't give us the right to kill human beings in general just to make life easier for other people. So I think that this premise is pretty sound. This leads me to premise two. The unborn are innocent human beings. How do we know this? First, the unborn are alive. They're growing by cellular reproduction. If they weren't alive, they wouldn't have to be aborted in the first place. Second, the unborn are human. We know they are human because they possess human DNA and are the offspring of human parents. Finally, unlike sperm, egg, or cancer cells, the unborn are a complete organism like you and I, who just need time, nutrition, and the proper environment to develop into an adult, provided their development is not cut short, directly or indirectly. The very words embryo and fetus can only be defined as particular stages of development in the life of a human organism. According to standard medical textbooks, an embryo is a human organism from fertilization until the seventh week of life. And a fetus is a human organism or human being from the eighth week of life until birth. Saying an unborn child is not human because he or she is a fetus or a blastocyst is as inane as saying a 15-year-old is not human because they're a teenager. I may have, may have your doubts sometimes, but they're all human. These are just stages of development. So from a strictly biological standpoint, the statement the unborn are human beings is, is, is an indisputable fact. The standard medical text, Human Embryology and Teratology, states, although human life is a continuous process, fertilization is a critical landmark because under ordinary circumstances, a new genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. Keith Moore in Persaud, TVN Persaud's textbook, The Developing Human, states, human life begins at fertilization. Langman's Medical Embryology also says development begins with fertilization. Finally, the fourth chapter of Scott Gilbert's textbook, Developmental Biology, is simply titled Fertilization, Beginning of a New Human Organism. And by fertilization, I also mean conception, when the sperm and egg come and create a new human being. Now, Dr. Potts likes to tout that he has a PhD in embryology, but he's not the only game in town. Meet Dr. Ward Kisher, Emeritus Professor of Cell Biology and Human Anatomy at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Here's what he had to say in a recent documentary on the question of when life begins. If there was an answer, I hoped a scientist who studies the beginning of human life would know it. My name is Ward Kisher. I'm Emeritus Professor of Cell Biology and Anatomy at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, specialty in human embryology. Embryology is the study of embryos, but more than that, 
It's the study of development, which does not cease at birth. A lot of people claim that no one can know when life begins, that it's merely a religious issue. Every human embryologist in the world knows that the life of the new individual human being begins at fertilization. It is not a belief. It is a scientific fact. In fact, the courts have upheld this basic scientific fact. In Planned Parenthood versus Rounds, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals found that requiring abortion providers to say that the fetus is a, quote, living separate whole human being does not force an abortionist to espouse an unconstitutional religious viewpoint. The court ruled that this statement was a biological fact that even physicians affiliated with Planned Parenthood accept. The ruling said, the state's evidence suggests that the biological sense in which the embryo or fetus is whole, separate, unique, and living should be clear in context to a physician. Planned Parenthood submitted no evidence to oppose that conclusion. Finally, even academic defenders of legal abortion concede that the unborn are human beings. David Boonin, author of A Defense of Abortion, writes, perhaps the most straightforward relation between you and me on the one hand and every human fetus on the other is this. All are living members of the same species, Homo sapiens. A human fetus, after all, is simply a human being at a very early stage in his or her development. The pro-choice philosopher Peter Singer also holds this view and writes, it is possible to give human being a precise meaning. We can use it as equivalent to member of the species Homo sapiens. In this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moment of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. Now, some people say that the unborn are biologically human, but they aren't fully human or they aren't a person. Well, whoever makes this claim, it better be able to give us a coherent definition of what a person is. You can't say something is not a person if you haven't the faintest idea what a person is in the first place. And notice in Dr. Pott's opening statement, he never defined what a person is. He simply said the unborn we're not people. That's an assumption, not an argument. But these alternate definitions of personhood that are crafted to exclude the unborn don't work. They lead to absurd or repugnant conclusions. For example, if a person is anything that can feel pain, then disabled humans who can't feel pain would not be persons. More importantly, any animal that could feel pain would be a person. If you fumigated a building to get rid of rats that can feel pain, that would be as morally wrong as using chemical weapons against women and children to destroy a village to make way for a factory. So it's clear that the ability to feel pain does not make someone a person. Now, some people will say, well, no, it's being human and being able to feel pain that makes you a person. But under this view, there would still be disabled people at the end of life and also at the beginning, such as unconscious newborns, who would not be persons and could be legally killed. Also, this criteria is arbitrary. If we're going to say a person is human plus something, then why not human plus a certain IQ? Or human plus being male? Or you could argue human plus female. Maybe women are genetically superior because they have more genetic components in their X chromosomes. Who knows? But I contend that saying all humans, all members of our community, are equal, regardless of their level of development or functional ability. But maybe there are criteria that determine who is a person. Let's look at two more. What about the ability to have rational thought? Under this definition, not only would the disabled not be people, uh, newborn infants would not be persons. If you have to be able to think rationally, no, new, no newborn infant can have rational thoughts. Uh, unless you're comfortable saying that newborns have the same value as rats, you can't say that rational thought is the standard that makes someone a person. The other common definition of a person is viability, or being able to survive outside of the uterus. But once again, there are lots of animals like squirrels or snakes that can survive outside of the womb, but they're not people. Viability doesn't automatically make you a person. Plus, this criteria would be arbitrary. A premature baby born in the United States at 25 weeks would be a person under this view. But if he or she were born in rural India, they would not. How can your value as a human being depend on whether the place you were born has clean water? Also, why does the fact that the unborn are very helpless, how does that prove they're not 
persons. Without technology, human beings are not viable at the bottom of the ocean or on the surface of the moon, but an astronaut or scuba diver whose gear malfunctions doesn't suddenly transform into a non-person. They're still a person. They won't be around for much longer, but they are still a person even if they are not viable. Or here's another example. Human beings are not viable on the planet Mars. But that wouldn't give Martians the right to abduct us and put us on their planet where we will asphyxiate to death like Arnold Schwarzenegger almost did in Total Recall. Likewise, the fact that the unborn cannot survive outside of the uterus does not give us the right to put them in an environment where they'll die, any more than Martians have the right to put us in an environment where we'll die. I'd like to offer a better proposal for what a person is. Essentially, a person is a member of a rational kind. When it comes to human beings, our human rights don't come from what we can do or how well we can think or whether we can survive on our own. They come from what we are, and equal human rights can only be grounded in the one thing that's truly equal about all of us, our human nature, not our fleeting functional abilities. Well, let's return to my argument. I think this premise is, is really indisputable now. Premise three, though, abortion directly kills unborn humans. Some people say abortion isn't really killing. All you're doing is removing the fetus from the womb where it has no right to be, and it dies because it can't survive anywhere else. But that's like saying, if you put your one-year-old outside during a blizzard, well, you're not killing him. You're putting him somewhere where he, does, you know, he doesn't have a right to be in your home. He doesn't pay rent. You own the place. You're putting him somewhere where he just can't survive. Uh, but that's absurd. In both cases, we're ending someone's life. So I think that so-called bodily autonomy arguments in favor of abortion simply don't work. For example, here's pro-choice philosopher Mary Ann Warren. She says, quote, the appeal to the right to control one's body, which is generally construed as a property right, is at best a rather feeble argument for the permissibility of abortion. Mere ownership does not give me the right to kill innocent people whom I find on my property. Even the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade said there is no absolute right to do whatever you want with your body. Justice Blackmun said, the court has refused to recognize an unlimited right of this kind in the past. If you engage in an activity that's ordered towards creating helpless children, then you have an obligation to provide and care for those children that you help to create. If you are a man, you have at the very least the obligation to provide child support for this person, even if you didn't intend to create him. If you are a woman, you have a responsibility to provide a safe environment in the womb for this child while he or she develops through the, fetal, through the embryonic and then the fetal stages of life. Now, I agree that parents don't have an obligation to donate organs like their kidneys to their children, but that's because those organs are for sustaining their own bodies, and any other use is extraordinary and therefore voluntary and heroic. But what is the uterus for, if not for sustaining the life of an unborn child? Don't the children we create through intercourse have a right to basic necessities like food, water, shelter? Pregnancy provides this, and it's a great sacrifice for women. My wife is in the third trimester of pregnancy right now, and I am seeing it is quite a sacrifice. But women's bodies are made and ordered towards this sacrifice. It is not the same as giving someone a kidney. Abortion is not the passive, it's not the same as failing to give someone a kidney, because abortion is not the passive removal of life support. It's the active killing of a healthy child via dismemberment. Prohibiting a mother from aborting her child is not like forcing someone to donate uh, their kidneys to save, some, to save someone's life. Instead, allowing a mother to abort her child is like giving someone a kidney and then taking it back after you've given, given it to them and killing them in the process. To demonstrate that abortion involves the direct killing of innocent human beings, I have provided visual evidence of what abortion does to human fetuses and human embryos. These photos come from the Center for Bioethical Reform and have been authenticated by medical professionals. Now, some of you may object that graphic images of abortion are merely appeals to emotion, but consider the words of pro-choice advocate Naomi Wolf. She writes, how can we charge that it is vile and repulsive for pro-lifers to brandish vile and repulsive images if the images are real? To insist that the truth is in poor taste is the very height of hypocrisy. Besides, if these images are often the facts of the matter, and if we then claim that it's offensive for pro-choice women to be confronted by them, 
then we are making the judgment that women are too inherently weak to face a truth about which they have to make a grave decision. This view of women is unworthy of feminism. And remember that Naomi Wolf is a pro-choice advocate. So I'll let you know when these pictures go up and when they'll go down, you don't have to look at them, but I would encourage you in the spirit of academic honesty to confront whatever evidence exists on this issue and weigh it objectively. So these are the abortion photos. You can look away if you do not want to see them. This is an image from the first trimester. Uh, the most 89% most of abortions take place within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. This would be another first trimester abortion. This fetus was removed probably through vacuum aspiration. It was dismembered through a suction tube. Uh, this is another first trimester abortion. The dime is for size comparison. And this is another close up of another first trimester abortion. The next photo is of a late term abortion. Uh, approximately 10,000 abortions take place at this stage of development every year in the United States. To put that into perspective, only about 8,500 people are killed by guns every year in the United States. The images are down if you want to look back. Now, let's look at some common objections to the, the pro-life position. Dr. Potts brought up in his opening statement, one I want to address at length is the objection that abortion must remain legal, otherwise it's unsafe. Now, I'm all for safe abortion. If abortion were as safe for the child as it is for the mother, I'd have no problem with it. But obviously it's not. It can't, there is no such thing as safe abortion, because when you think of the woman and the child, half the people involved are always killed. So it's never safe for the child. It's designed to end their life. So this argument is simply fallacious. Just as we should not keep it legal to make it safer for bigger born people to kill smaller born people, we should not keep it legal so that it is safer for bigger born people to kill smaller unborn people. Which I've, and so this argument only works when you assume the unborn are not human beings, and I've shown that assumption is incorrect. Even pro-choice philosophers agree this is a bad argument for legal abortion. Mary Ann Warren writes, the fact that restricting access to abortion has tragic side effects does not in itself show that the restrictions are unjustified since murder is wrong, regardless of the consequences of prohibiting it. Now, I agree, it is tragic whether anyone, a mother or, or her child, dies from a legal or an illegal abortion. But the answer to preserving women's health is not keeping it legal to kill one of the people involved in pregnancy, the child. We should be able to care for both, and the evidence shows us that we can. First, as this graph shows, maternal mortality or women dying from pre during pregnancy was already dropping dramatically prior to Roe versus Wade due to the introduction of things like antibiotics. In fact, uh, so women were, there were not thousands of women dying every year from illegal abortions, as Dr. Potts uh, inferred in his presentation. In fact, Mary Calderon, the former president of Planned Parenthood, said in 1960 that, quote, abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure. Uh, this applies not just to therapeutic abortions as performed in hospitals, but also to so-called illegal abortions as done by physicians. He says, in, she says in 1957, there were, 200 and, there were only 260 deaths in the whole country attributed to abortions of this kind. Now, each of those deaths is tragic, but the answer, my friends, is not to make it legal to kill the other person involved in pregnancy. In fact, Dr. Potts himself said in 1977, that those who want the abortion law to be liberalized will stress the hazards of illegal abortion and claim that hundreds or thousands of women die unnecessarily each year when the actual number is far lower. And he said this four years after Roe versus Wade. Also, modern countries that outlaw nearly all abortions, like Poland or Ireland, have low maternal mortality rates. In fact, their maternal mortality rates are one-fourth the level we see in the United States where abortion is legal through all nine months of pregnancy. I want to actually talk, and you can see Ireland and Poland on this map, abortion is outlawed and they have very low abortion rates. I'd like to talk about the country Dr. Potts brought up, which is the country of Romania. As you see, it has legal abortion in the first trimester. It also has one of the highest abortion rates in all of Europe. Has that led to a dramatic reduction in maternal mortality? Well, if we see here, look, it's even higher than these other countries where abortion uh, is much more restricted. So my point is that legal abortion is not essential to low levels of maternal mortality. Uh, and oftentimes these figures are, are embellished by pro-choice advocates. A study by Koch et al. in 2012 in the International Journal of Women's Studies 
showed this. And I want to go back to my main argument, though, which is the moral argument that if the unborn are not human beings, if they are not human beings, Dr. Potts is completely right. We should have abortion everywhere. We should pay for abortions. And I could care less if the unborn are not human beings. But if they are human beings with the same basic rights you and I possess, then it's unjust to say we should keep it legal so that it's safer for bigger people to kill them. And that, that's simply unjust. So I'd like to look now, while I have a few minutes left, at some of the other points that Dr. Potts brought up. He said abortion is common. Well, sure, but so is child abuse, child labor, and spousal abuse. Just because something is common doesn't mean that it's right. He says outlawing abortion doesn't stop it. Well, sure it doesn't. Whenever you outlaw something, it's going to continue. But when you make something illegal, it does reduce it. My point of view is that women are rational, law-abiding citizens, and that when laws are passed, women will follow them. The view that says women will get lots of illegal abortions assumes women are not law-abiding, which I think is, is an affront to women's dignity. Now, number three, he says it's not about who's right and who's wrong. Well, it actually is. This is a false neutrality. Dr. Potts holds the view that I am incorrect, that the unborn are not human beings and they do not deserve to be protected under the law. We disagree. That's fine. The question is, when two people disagree, where does the evidence support their view? And I'm the only one who presented evidence tonight about whether the unborn are human or not. He said there are no absolutes in embryology. Well, that's as contradictory as saying, I can't speak a word of English. Just think about it. There's no absolutes in embryology, except for the absolute that there are no absolutes. And that's simply, that's simply not the case. I would say Dr. Potts is absolutely committed to abortion being legal. There's one. So we have to get to where the evidence leads us. He also said that high death rates in early embryos, uh, that many unborn children die naturally, justifies us ending their lives ourselves. Well, that's like saying because people over the age of 85 have very high rates of death from things like heart attacks, it's okay to kill people over the age of 85. That doesn't follow at all. Just because someone's in danger of dying doesn't give us the right to kill them. In fact, I was very disturbed what Dr. Potts said in his opening statement, essentially this, if nature fails to kill a human, I'll help in that process. I remember that uh, the Hippocratic Oath says to, to do no harm, and that should apply to every human being. He said, we don't know if anyone has a soul. Science can't find a soul. That's absolutely right. Science can't show anyone in this building has a soul because the soul is an immaterial, philosophical, and theological concept. I haven't brought up souls in my presentation. My presentation is not a religious argument. I agree that we should have religious liberty, but religious liberty cannot be absolute. In Reynolds versus the United States in the 19th century, the court ruled that uh, polygamists didn't have the right to use their religious liberty to have as many wives as they wanted. The court said, if you could do anything you wanted in the name of religion, every man would be a law unto himself. Should we tolerate people's religious beliefs that infants are not children and could be sacrificed to some god? Well, clearly not. We have to have limits. We have to stop people if they use their religious beliefs to hurt other innocent human beings. And that would apply to human beings from the moment they are conceived. Um, and finally, I mean, he's brought up the point that, that we don't know when life begins. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll end here. We, I mean, we certainly, we do. This is an empirical question I provided evidence for. We know when life ends. We can tell the difference between someone who's alive and someone who's a corpse. Scientifically, we can determine the difference between sperm and egg body cells and a new human organism. So to conclude, uh, just as uh, my point of view is this, why I'm pro-life. Every human being, regardless of their religion, nationality, sexual orientation, level of physical development, deserves the same basic rights. Maybe not the same social privileges, like the right you know, to drive a car, but the right to not be tortured and the right to not be killed. Those rights should apply to all human beings, no matter how young they are, and no matter they're men or women, or born or unborn. So thank you very much. Okay, great. So we will now take a five minute break and then we'll have question and answer segment. But we do want to stress when you guys come back that because this is a very sensitive issue and it's very personal and controversial, you guys remain like very cognizant of other people's views and that you're extra cautious when you're asking questions to be respectful of everyone in the room. So have a five minute break and then please join us again. So um, I'd like to invite both of the speakers to come back onto stage um, as we begin our Q&A portion. 
Um, so the way that this is going to happen is um, if you um, have a question for um, either of the two, um, you can go ahead and line up in the aisles, and then Ari is going to be running the money back and forth for you to ask questions. So at this point, if you do have a question, please um, feel free to come on up. Can you just give them? Thanks. Um, can I ask a question? I have a broad question. So why is it that we define abortion as killing human beings? So why is it that we want to like limit it to just human beings? Why can we define? Why can we say that it's bad to kill for human beings? Why can't we say it's bad to kill for like extension being that people pay? So why do we define all that? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think I see your question. Well, I think that we have a deep, resounding intuition that human beings matter more than other sentient creatures. For example, if there was a house that was on fire and you saw that there was, let's say, well, let's say it's an orphanage that's on fire. And there is a, this is why I'm saying this. And there is a baby inside who has no relatives. And you, there are also three chipmunks. Now, if just being sentient, being an animal mattered, it would seem to make sense we should save those three sentient chipmunks over the infant. But people don't really, don't really believe that. So I, I think that we understand humans matter more so than other animals, even if they have equal sentience. Uh, but for me, the only thing that can explain why infants matter more than you know cows and dogs and horses is because they're members of the human species. And the unborn, like embryos and fetuses, are also members of the human species they should be valued as well. Well, I think all three nails are suggesting there's some sort of divine business difference. Um, certainly, um, I think we should give much more respect to other animals, particularly animals with big brains. Personally, I would rather do a six-week abortion than kill a sperm and whale with a three-and-a-half kilogram brain. I think that it's, for me, the dividing line is when the brain begins to develop in the embryo. And I think it shows playing tricks with words. And this is the, the whole trick to me, unborn human beings, innocent human beings. It's a tautology that has absolutely no meaning. It's a faith assertion, it's not a fact. beautifully as well as gruesomely tackle the definition of where life begins. But can you give me sound data that proves that you're not removing your chances of survival as well as suffering from more people? You said yourself just now that the reason why we don't, we don't look at animals as much as human beings is because we don't realize them as we care about human beings more. But don't we care about human beings that actually feel suffering more? When I went to Honduras, a prostitute who had to be a prostitute in order to survive had to have a fifth child because she cannot have an abortion in that country. Do you feel that having that fifth child who may not survive, as well as who may lead more people, of her fam people in her family to die, is actually more better to save more people, as you said your goal was, than to actually let her have the abortion? May I ask, may I ask you a question? Uh, this uh, and my, uh, my wife actually just visited Honduras on, on a mission trip as well and told me a little bit of what, what's going, what life is like there. Let's say that this woman who's in very difficult economic strains, uh, she might have this fifth child she can't care for. Do you think it would, let's say, suppose one of her children is a newborn infant. Uh, would it be wrong for her to kill that newborn infant painlessly in her sleep? to make way for the fifth child. Sorry, but the newborn infant can suffer. The newborn infant feels suffering. Mm -hmm. The embryo, the fertilized country, recently conceived embryo does not. Okay, so your, your point is simply that uh, sentience is what- What you said before to that girl said question. Actually, no, my answer to the question was not that. My point was that sentience is not what gives us our value or our rights as people because we treat equally sentient beings unequally. We're fine fumigating a building full of sentient rats, but not bombing a village full of sentient people. 
So there must be a criteria beyond sentience that grants us value. And to me, when we look at the data, the only difference between sentient creatures we kill routinely, like cows or turkeys, you know, in a few days at least, is that uh, human beings, especially newborn infants, are members of the human community. And my position is just that all members of the human community, regardless of how able-bodied they are, which is their level of sentience, should be treated equally. And I say to discriminate against someone because of how sentient they are is ableism, and I, I reject it. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, you presented some data comparing the relative maternal, the maternal um, deaths in no. Ireland and Romania, um, supporting the fact that even though like Romania has legalized abortion, they still have more deaths than Ireland. But do you take into consideration the fact that Ireland is a much more developed country than Romania and their health system is actually very good, like even better than the United States? So wouldn't it be better to compare that to an equally developed country, like something that's on par with Romania and something that's on par with Ireland? Because their health system also determines if someone, when they go into a hospital, are they going to die or are they going to live? That's a very good question. And actually, I did do that in one of my slides. I compared the maternal mortality rates between Ireland, Poland, and the United States, uh, where Ireland and Poland have much more restricted access to abortion. And in those modern countries like the United States, maternal mortality is much lower. My point was not that making abortion illegal in and of itself automatically raises or lowers the levels of maternal mortality. My point in showing examples of modern countries where abortion is made illegal shows that it is possible to outlaw abortion and still have low levels of maternal mortality. That legal abortion, it's not essential to that, and I, I think the data I've shown, which was sourced from the CIA World Factbook, uh, shows that. Sharon, you want to be telling me about the time? Uh, can I? Uh, I, I like. Uh, I like to ask one word from moderators. Uh, excuse me, I like one word from moderators. If Dr. Potts can comment on my answers, may I comment on his in the future? Sure. All right. Let me tell you about that. At the rates of abortion in relation to the number of fertile women, Irish women have no abortion to finish with, but they have them in England. Who have the data in front of the level. That's why they have the abortions. Would you like me to, to respond? Or it's a fact. You can respond to it. Well, I think you got your say, and now I'll, I'll respond when you have, have other answers. So, all right. I'm just a bit confused about the distinction of there seem to be different viewpoints on how you define where it lies with um, Just because sperm and egg cells are both living, as far as I've been taught on my science class, with it. Also, having been taught my playing classes that that life has gone, you know, before me, before my father, and yeah. as I've been taught millions of years back, so how do you define that life has begun? Or there's that, how do you draw that line? Is this is for both of us. Either, yeah. Yeah, well, I first of all, we set aside the germ cells when we were in the ambulance. I actually think it's the, 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 the key question in his life again. We need to recognize that religions have had all different teachings. The Catholic Church has taught and has spoken at very different times. Muslims are divided as to whether, uh, you know, whether it's 40 days after fertilization. And therefore, some Muslim communities like uh, Tunisia permit safe abortion. So there are differences of opinion here. All we have to recognize is that it's a sincere difference of opinion. And there is no way of proving when life begins. And my response to that is that's simply patently false. For example, everyone knows that a woman who seeks an abortion, their life has begun. So we know that a newborn infant's life has begun. So we do know at certain points, we have to tease out our reasoning in that regard. My point is that not that human life matters, just having human DNA, but being an organism that has parts that integrate together for the good of the whole. And my point was I presented a scientific view. On the Catholic perspective that Dr. Potts brought up, he's correct that different uh, Catholic authorities weren't sure when the soul entered the body, 
But going back through church history, through the, the Didache, Tertullian in the third century, Basil the Great in the fourth century, and onwards, the t Catholic teaching has been that abortion is always a grave moral evil. But that's just a theological issue. My point isn't about souls, it's about human organisms. And I've shown that the unborn, think about this, go home tonight, here's your, here's your experiment. Look up the definition of embryo and fetus. Just go ahead and look it up. It will tell you it's an organism, a human organism at a certain stage of development. And my perspective is that humans, regardless of what level of development they're at, are, are equally valuable. That the difference between sperm and egg and the unborn, fetuses and embryos, that when you get fetuses and embryos, time, nutrition, and the proper environment, they can develop into an adult, unless they're killed beforehand. Sperm and egg can't do that because they're not organisms, but the unborn are human organisms, just the younger ones in, in our species. Why do you think the pregnancies develop in the whole form this genetic unique, this human organism, we don't baptize it, we incinerate it, and we also remove it. And I'll say that's not true, Doc. You can look it up online. A gadiform mole is not a human organism. Its parts aren't integrated towards developing into an adult. Oh, it's, a it's, it's, a collection, okay. it's a collection of tissue. It's not an organism. And a collection of tissue and a potential organization of tissue. We're in the world. We're in the world. Okay, let's remind everyone that this is not a debate. We're having questions and answers. So let's move forward. Excuse me. Mom. That's the book. I, I'd like a, I would like a point of order. I, I'm fine returning to the original format where neither of us may comment yes, on each other's answers. that's what you would like to have happen. So, okay, thank you. And also, we are recommending that only students come and ask questions, so if there's anyone else from outside the committee, if you could please hold off on it. Yes, to, to stray away from the debate, um, my question is for Mr. Horn. Uh, you didn't go over at any point in your presentation what your opinion was on uh, abortions that are a result of pregnancies that happen from rape cases. So I was wondering what your opinion was on this. I think that the culture, it is safe to say we live in what's called a rape culture. Uh, we live in a culture that stigmatizes women and that rape, women are victimized by rape, not just by the rape itself, but by society, for example, through victim blaming, uh, by saying they did something to incur this. Uh, and in some parts of the world, the, the harm women suffer from rape is even worse than in the United States. For example, women are killed if they are raped and then become pregnant through something that's called honor killing. And I would say that's barbaric. We understand it is wrong to kill women who become pregnant during rape. And actually, in our own country, it is illegal to execute rapists. So when pregnancy occurs through a rape, it's a horrible, tragic, awful thing with no good solution. But think what we realize, and there's three people, the mother who's attacked, the child created, and the rapist. We have agreed that the mother shouldn't be killed. We even agree the rapist shouldn't be killed. My point is simply that the child, who's equally human and equally innocent, uh, shouldn't be killed either. Um, hello, my uh, question is more on the scope of economics, and it, I'd like to hear both of your opinions on it. Um, but, I mean, we all agree that having a baby is very expensive, and going through the process can be, um, you know, emotionally and physically traumatic for the woman. In situations where the woman is not uh, economically apt to support the child, um, does that play a role in your, in your stance on abortion? Well, it would if the unborn were not human beings. So if they weren't human beings, I would say you don't need a reason. Have an abortion for any or no reason you want. But if they are human beings, we should apply the same rules to them. For example, when someone's in a difficult economic or social situation, we don't encourage violence or criminal activity to solve it. So if someone's lost their job and is on welfare, we wouldn't encourage them to rob a bank to reduce their income and quality. So I would say that violence and criminality are not good answers towards economic inequality, whether it's towards born people or towards unborn people. If the unborn are human, we should treat them the same way and, and not kill them just because they happen to be impoverished. In my experience, when we seek an abortion, most of them seek an abortion because they love children. And they know they cannot give their child the love and care that every baby deserves. And that's why they seek knowledge. Um, I can ask you a question. So I noticed in the presentation of your arguments, you use a lot of analogies. Um, I was just wondering if you could 
um, present your arguments without a um, subjective uh, definition of what a person is without using analogies? You, wait, do you, you want me to give a definition of a person without? To an, use, I want you to um, tell me why you're pro-life without analogies. Okay. Here's, I, I mean, I can do that, but I don't think there's anything wrong with analogies. Let me say that the issue of abortion, what we're talking about here, is, a, is an issue of philosophy. It deals with moral reasoning. When we have a moral issue where people disagree, what moral philosophers do is they make analogies. They try to find a situation that resembles the disputed issue, but is sufficiently like it to gauge our moral judgments. So I would say the reason that I am pro-life is because I believe all members of the human community, all human organisms, no matter how old or developed they are, no matter what accidental traits they have, deserve to be treated equally. And that we know embryos and fetuses, those are just lower stage for development in the life of a human being. Just as we would, well, you said no analogies. My point is simply this. We, this is an analogy. We don't kill human beings because they're, directly kill them because they're unwanted or they make life more difficult. If someone's in a difficult life situation, we should help them and provide whatever non-violent support we can for them. But we should not kill innocent human beings and I think I've shown from the scientific evidence, the unborn fit under the definition of what a human being is as much as a born person. So my question is about rights. Um, so you talk a lot about how the unborn fetus has a human right to live. Um, so what about the unborn fetus's right to live is like able to restrict a woman's right to choose whether or not to have. Okay, so the question is about the conflict of rights. So my question is, why do you feel that an unborn baby's right to live is somehow superior than a woman's right to choose? Because I think we've all established that there are different situations when an abortion might be necessary. I think that's been established, but I'll answer the question. <laughs> At any time we make decisions, there's going to be conflicts in rights. Uh, let's take, here's an example. Uh, suppose someone runs a business and they have a right to religious uh, liberty, uh, for example, or they have a right to hire or fire whomever they please. And suppose they have an employee who has a right to work there regardless of their sexual orientation. So some people would say, you have the right to, do you have the right to fire someone because they identify as gay or lesbian? Conflict of rights. Does the owner have the right to hire and fire who he wants? Or does the employee have the right to not be discriminated against because of sexual orientation? I think most people in this room will go with the view that the employee should not be discriminated against in something basic like the ability to work because of a certain biological trait, such as having a certain sexual orientation. My point is that in the hierarchy of rights, the right to live, the right to exist, is the most basic right that we have. And I think it makes sense that that right trumps other rights we have, including the right to choose to do what we want with our bodies, because no one has the right to use their body to take away the life of another human being unjustly. So that's how I would kind of answer that. Good afternoon. So uh, in your argument, you discussed how only in divorce a man and woman are both responsible. You talked about how the man's responsibility is mostly financial supporting money. I said at the least, at the least. At least. Okay. Well, the woman's responsibility is to carry and endure this very perilous and total induced process of giving birth. Uh, where do we make the disparity between the two? So, my question for you guys would be uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> my question for you guys would be. Uh, <laughs> Do we as men have a say in whether or not a woman has the choice of abortion or to endure a pregnancy? Dr. Poster, can you answer? Or? I hope you have a say. I hope you have a say. I haven't supported you. I think that's an interesting response. Uh, to say you should have a say, but you should support her. If by support her means allow her 
to have the abortion for any reason, then de facto you don't actually have a say at all. Uh, here's what I would say. Should men have an opinion on abortion? I would say you can have an opinion on a social justice issue, if it, even if it doesn't affect you. Women can have an opinion on the military draft. We can have an opinion on child labor, even though we are never going to be children in sweatshops. If men can't have an opinion on abortion, then that means Roe versus Wade should be overturned because it was decided by nine male Supreme Court justices. I'll give you that women during pregnancy incur a greater biological hardship, but women's bodies are naturally ordered towards that. It's not extraordinary like giving someone an organ. Uh, it's difficult, but many things in our life are difficult. Does that mean it justifies killing uh, the unborn child? I don't think so. It's, if this child is a human being, and if they have a right to live, what does that mean? To me, the only sensible answer to that is they have a right to the only thing that can sustain them, which is being able to live within the bodies of their mothers. And I think that I agree, men should not just be giving out money, they should be helping this tremendous hardship as much as they can. But the fact of the matter is we shouldn't kill the unborn just because raising them can be very difficult at the beginning of their lives. And hello. Um, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. Um, it it's it's uh, kind of along the lines in the idea of, you know, in the presentation that you presented, um, a lot of your scientific evidence had to do with uh, male perspectives, especially in terms of the books that you uh, mentioned. Although you did have certain uh, quotes from individual women who have their own opinions about abortion, um, one of the questions that I really wanted to ask um, is can you can you speak to how access to abortion disproportionately affects women of color, especially women of social, uh, lower social economic status? And I would uh, hope that you could give me a different um, way of connecting other than your wife, because I don't know what your situation is. You know, you may have to be a very supportive husband. That's what's up. Time. Your, one, your, your wife is the one who has to experience pregnancy. Your wife is the one who has to make those decisions. So I feel like every time you would use that as, as a way to argue against certain, or whatever, I don't know how you're using it, whatever, I don't know you in space. But anyways, um, I would prefer that you want to give me an example of how your wife is in, is, um, shows that you're being supported by the male husband. Okay, so your question was, I, when I talk about the impact of how okay. abortion on people, women of color. They're women of color and also low, lower socioeconomic status. Mm, sure. Uh, I would say that we do live in a country that is still dealing with the effects of what is called uh, institutional racism. So because of what happened uh, hundreds of years ago, and even decades ago, when people from different uh, minority groups, being African American, uh, Hispanic, Asian, what have you, has created a system where those in these minority groups face more hardships than I do. I certainly agree I have. I am probably the, this is Bertha, I'm probably the most privileged guy here. So, and I, and, and I know when I say I don't get it, that means hopefully I get it. So let me, let me continue. In terms of thinking about it in terms of how is this person affected? Well, let me, let me continue with my answer. So my point is that yes, people in minority uh, communities and lower socioeconomic communities suffer from many different hardships. And so we should try to alleviate those and help those uh, women where we can such that they don't have access to health care for both them and their babies, such as the lack of prenatal care, for example. I believe that the unborn children in lower economic socio groups, they are really out of the boat now. They, they have a lot going against them. So both the mothers and the children in these communities uh, need more of our support. So I'll give you the communities are Facing, they face more challenges than others do, but those challenges also affect the unborn child. If the child's a human being, we should help them and help them. <laughs> so, uh, throughout this discussion, there's been a sort of emphasis on the idea of being human, and I was just wondering why is being human even relevant? Because we have things like the death penalty, where um, which just by name protecting larger society uh, and to limit damage to others. So, uh, regardless of whether or not fetuses are humans, 
How can you say that it's wrong to get rid of them when you know that it might cause damage to mothers? And how can you still call it innocent when it threatens the life of mother? All right, here's how I'll answer that. First, when I use the term innocent, I mean without malice. Uh, despite what you might see in certain cartoons like Family Guy, I don't think the unborn child has a malicious intent from the moment they begin to exist in the womb. So they have no malice. They're simply, they're doing what they naturally are supposed to do, which is grow in the womb. And pregnancy has its hardships and also its blessings along with it, good and bad. But the, the child is not intending to harm anyone in any way, and they should be protected. When it comes to being human, you're correct. We have the death penalty, uh, but the death penalty is given out to those who have been found guilty in a court of law in order to protect the, the common good. We don't execute innocent people. We recognize that's an injustice. For example, when Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, if the evidence points towards that being him being shot when he raises his hands in the air and ha does, is not threatening anyone, we understand that's wrong. You don't kill innocent human beings like that, even if you feel a remote sense of danger. So if born human beings, members of the human species, should have those rights. I would say the unborn should have those rights as well because I don't see a morally relevant difference that shows born humans should have rights and the unborn should not without, without bringing in even other sentient animals. So that, that's how I would answer the question. Okay, I actually have two questions. One is my main one and one like small question. My first one is, well, the question seems to be, okay, should abortion be legal or not? That seems to be one of the topics of debate today. Let's say if it is made illegal. That means that those who have illegal abortions, will they be treated as a criminal for committing murder? Is that what then the ramification would be? If it's illegal in the United States, for a woman to have an abortion, and then she seeks alternative options such as the bad method or having other physicians, people who have privilege to get private physicians in their home and form those, then get away, you know, the more privilege you have, the more likely, likeliness of you getting away with crimes. Like, you know, we all were here for the lecture where we had, like, the needle project in SF, like, prevent something by an alternative approach, right? Like, that you might not know what we're talking about, but, like, for people, so it's like for people who are, you know, addicted to drugs, instead of saying stop, you get addicted to drugs, let's give you oh, safe places to inject needles. So giving them between needles instead of like allowing them to be needles. So I guess with that kind of like thing in mind, if like Dr. Fox is showing that, okay, if you legalize it, then you are reducing mortality rates, and you know, you did present, you know, counter evidence. But I guess my main question is that what would happen then if it's illegal? Are you gonna arrest people for having a, illegal abortions? Are you gonna punish them? Are you gonna put them to the penalty? What's gonna happen then? Okay, uh, on one point, if we make abortion legal, how does it affect mortality rates? We might disagree on, on the maternal mortality rates, but I think we can agree that the fetal mortality rates are probably in the sky. So let's, we'll, we'll put that one in there if abortion is, it already is legal, we make it legal, but those rates go up a lot, those are humans. And they matter. The question of what should the legal punishment be for aborting an unborn child, we have to answer another question before that, which is what should the punishment be for a parent who kills their child? And the answer to that question is it depends. Because when someone is involved in a crime, we talk about circumstance, we talk about intent, every case is different. But I think when, when a parent ends the life of their child, we have an, an instinct that there's some punishment that's warranted. For example, in 2009 in Virginia, a woman gave birth to a child in a hotel room and she smothered the child to death with a pillowcase. She was not charged with a crime because the umbilical cord had not been cut. So I would appeal to all of you, if you have a sense of that, that that was a crime and should have been punished when that child was killed the minute after they were born, just and there's no crime because the umbilical cord is attached, should not there be some legal sanction five minutes before that? Five months? We live in a country where uh, I don't think people are that culpable when they choose abortion because our government says it's okay, medical professionals say it's okay. So I think that individual women's culpability for choosing abortion may not be very high, but if abortion becomes, if the unborn are recognized as human beings, I would just say if you kill a human being, there should be a punishment. What that is would, would be based on the intent and the circumstances. Thank you. And the second question is very good question. 
if you actually have looked at the definition of embryo before telling us to go home and look at it, or even on our phones to look at it, because embryo is an unborn or unhatched offspring in the process of development. And in other definitions, it talks about animals, like frogs and chickens. Yes, absolutely. So you quite confident claim that embryo refers to human? I said when it's used in the context of human beings, it refers to a stage of development. You're right, there are cat embryos, there are dog embryos, there are frog embryos. Embryo refers to the beginning of an organism's life. If you look up what a human embryo is, uh, and most medical dictionaries will talk about embryo in a broad sense, and then say, in humans, this offspring, aka organism, is from the moment of conception until the seventh week of life. So you're right, but an offspring, that's another word for an organism. There's cat and dog embryos and there are human embryos, and humans stop being an embryo when they're seven, when they're eight weeks old. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sherry Zuber. Mm -hmm. I'd like to make an announcement that we do have five minutes of Q&A left, and then we will be having closing statements from both uh, would speakers. Be, would it be possible, maybe if anyone has a question for Dr. Potts, to give them a, a preference? I'd love to hear his thoughts. <laughs> well, never mind. <laughs> I, I was curious if you could um, define the word conception because I've heard it used to refer to fertilization. I've also heard it referred to um, as implantation. And so like, depending on what you define conception as, that defines the beginning of a pregnancy, which would then define abortion. So if you could define conception, that would be helpful. It's an interesting question because it's been defined the two ways that you have. Um, the Anglican Church and the Archbishop of Canterbury defined conception as implantation. A lot of people define conception as the fertilization of the egg. So it's a very good example. Well, it's very difficult to get absolutes in a continuous developing process. I'm sorry, I'm um, I have a question. I was wondering if you could speak to the point of where, when a woman is pregnant, when it's part of us in the picture, and how we feel about the last place a woman becomes pregnant and cannot have a child without the fear of death. Sure. Uh, I would say that when human beings, when their lives are in danger, we should do our best to save as many lives as we can but we should not kill one person to save another. For example, we shouldn't kill the mom uh, in order to save the child or vice versa. I think that uh, in the case that's the most common when this occurs, in late in pregnancy, if there's a life-threatening complication, what we could do is we could do an early uh, delivery or a cesarean section. The child may not survive that, but at least we're giving them a chance. We're not, we're not dismembering them in the process. Early, in, in the case like an ectopic pregnancy, we might remove the damaged section of the fallopian tube where there's a problem. In that case, we're treating a medical problem and saving one person instead of losing two. So that's what I would say in, in those cases, but I would just reiterate, the vast majority of abortions aren't done to, to stop someone from dying. They're done to ensure the death of the unborn child so the parents' lives can continue on. So that would be my answer. So I guess this would be a question for both of you, but more for you specifically. Well, many conservatives have a very pro-life stance, you know, on moral and religious grounds. And your argument is that human beings should not be aborted well, because they're innocent human beings. And yet many of these same conservatives say, like, like they won't fund like the same programs that would come to affect that unwanted child's life, like maybe less money for housing, education, like health care. And so like, if you're saying that, like, oh, like, these unwanted individuals have, like, a right to birth, a right to life, then how are they going to get access for this, those same rights in, like, education, housing, health care, if many pro-life argue, if many of those in politics who argue for, for pro-life are not ones to give support to those kind of programs? Okay, so the question is essentially, are conservatives hypocrites when they say they're pro-life, but appear to you know, slash funding for, for social service programs and other things like that. What it means to be pro-life, the definition I'm proposing is that all human beings have a right to live 
and can't be deprived of that right without due process of law. So it's not it would be hypocritical to say for conservatives to say it's okay to kill born people, but there's not unborn people. That would be hypocritical. Cutting federal funding for programs, which we can debate whether it's right or wrong, that doesn't fall uh, under that purview. So I would say that to be consistent, and my affirmation is just all human beings should have a right to live. Interestingly enough, liberals have a problem on this issue too. For example, liberals will support abortion and say people should have a right to choose, but many of them politically don't believe people should have the right to choose uh, maybe to own a firearm, the right to choose to fire someone with a certain sexual orientation, the right to choose to not join a union, the right to choose to have funds to go to charter schools. So there are many liberals who say I'm pro-choice on abortion, but these other choices, well, we've got to restrict them because they hurt people. So I would say if a choice hurts someone, we should restrict it, and I think I've shown the choice to have an abortion greatly harms uh, the young more child. In the interest of time, this is going to be our last question. Thank you, student, for being polite and courteous and asking your question. Hi. Uh, so my question has to do with bodily autonomy. Um, so say you were in a car with your brother and you got in a car accident, and he was hurt really bad, and he's dying, and he needs a blood transfusion, and you're doing okay, and so, but there's no way that you're legally required to give him blood, and so you can't be required to give him life, and so... Why is that situation different from like a woman wanting to have an abortion and like get rid of the clump of cells instead of like wanting to carry a uh, bee for a nine month and then have to provide for it once it's born? Here's how I would answer that question. First, uh, I could say, I could, if, if we're going to use the pejorative term clump of cells, I could say, well, yeah, I don't have to give my brother who's just a clump of cells, you know, he's living at home or whatnot, my blood. Here's the difference in those two cases. If I choose to not donate my blood to save his life, I'm not the one who has killed him. He is dying because of something associated with the accident he was involved in. I don't kill him, I fail to save him. Second, my blood is ordered towards sustaining my own body, not anyone else's. So it would be extraordinary and voluntary for me to donate it to him. In pregnancy, it's very different. Uh, we're not failing to save. In the case of my brother dying, he's sick and dying. I'm not saving him. The child in the womb is perfectly healthy most of the time, nearly all the time, is healthy and abortion kills that healthy child via dismemberment. And second, it, it involves the use of the uterus, the rest of the pregnant woman's body, of course, but primarily the uterus is ordered towards sustaining the child. So it's not asking for something unnatural or extraordinary to let the child live there. So I, I don't think those bodily autonomy arguments succeed. And since the last question I would plug, if you want to see the fuller reply to bodily autonomy arguments or my pro-life view, I've written a book on this subject called Persuasive Pro-Life that you can get at uh, Amazon.com or other online retailers. Thank you. Yeah, that was a question. <laughs> Um, so now we'll be hearing um, just some pretty closing statements um, and start with Professor Potts. Um, we just take about three minutes to conclude any thoughts. Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, again, there are always exceptions. At birth, if you have twins, they can be locked with one head caught behind the other. The only way to save the mother's life and one twin's life is to cut one twin's head off. I've never faced that. Challenge and I'm glad I've never fixed it, but sometimes you do nasty things to save their lives. So I think we keep on coming back to when does life begin? And Trent has given many analogies and a repeated assertion that we are all, to quote, unborn human beings, innocent human beings. If you simply repeat something sufficiently often, it does not become true. I'm not saying he's wrong, I'm saying he can't prove he's right. Any moment I can prove that I think that the rights and autonomy of the should be given later in life. Neither of us can prove our position. We both sincere people, we both follow uh, what our heart tells us to do and what our experience with other people do. I am glad we showed my side of the United Kingdom, but abortions were death were quite rare before we changed the law. Interestingly, when we changed the law, because of the way we said, they looked at the trumping. I'm not saying no one is clear, Jane, but we did an analysis in the British Parliament. The people who voted for capital punishment also voted against abortion. I don't think we should execute people at all. It's just a personal belief. It goes with my belief about when 
uh, life begins. Uh, Adolf Hitler was against abortion. The last person to be executed for conducting abortion was a woman in Vichy dominated France who was guillotined in 1942 because she was an abortionist. I don't think transcendentally we should give it to an abortionist, but there is uh, an all uh, Stalin first level abortion laws. Nikolai Ceausescu did, Indian Ming did. They're not very nice people. I think Britain in the 1960s was a much more liberal, empathetic society when it made abortion legal than it was in Victorian times when we sent little boys up, up chimneys and then fog sails. I think there is a general awe about a more civilized society, recognizing the diversity of views and giving women the ability to choose to have a safe abortion. I have seen abortion deaths are very common in some parts of the world. Last time I was in Ghana, uh, they were three in a bed, and the sick woman was on the top, and the two less sick women were under, underneath. Ethiopia has recently changed its abortion law. We have been teaching people to do safe abortions. We went to a remote health centre and we asked the midwife, this is, you know, the yucky thing to say, it's perfectly true. We asked her, have you seen anything different since we made a safe abortion available? She said, yes, the smell has gone. The smell has gone. We need really dying from an infected uterus smell. It's a horrible way to die. And it was so common that that's what they associated with the health centre. It totally disappeared after we made abortion safe. I'd like to close and ask you all leaving here tonight to think of just two concepts when you leave when it comes to the issue of abortion. Because the issue of abortion derives from a more fundamental issue. And that's this, who matters and who doesn't? Who has rights and who should be respected and who shouldn't? Throughout history, when people have made excuses to disqualify some humans from having rights, they have always been wrong. They have always picked morally trivial differences. They have said someone's race matters, their sex, their sexual orientation, their functional ability or their levels of intelligence. So the two things I want you to think of are equality and evidence. First, we should be committed to equality. That none of us in this room are equal. Some people are smarter than others. You guys go to Berkeley. I'm gonna say almost everyone here is gonna be smarter than I am, but it doesn't mean you're more human than I am or that you should have more basic rights like the right to live. Even though human beings are unequal, uh, we have unequal uh, lifestyles, backgrounds where we grew up, we all still believe in fundamental equal rights, and that should be grounded in the one thing that's equal about all of us, our human nature. There was a time when uh, African pygmies were said to be less intelligent than Europeans, and 100 years ago, they were put in human zoos. And now today, we say the unborn, because they can't function, think, or feel like us, they should be treated differently and be, be legally dismembered. So I would say be committed to human equality, that all humans matter, regardless of who they are. And second, follow the evidence where it leads. If, if anyone's made assertions tonight, it's been Dr. Potts. He never defined what a human being was, and he never presented any evidence except for a slide showing an unborn child. Remember, I presented you tonight embryology textbooks. I had an interview with an embryologist. I showed you uh, pro-choice philosophers who support legal abortion that agree with me we know when life begins. So I presented evidence. That, the, uh, that human organisms, from the moment they begin to exist, should have the same equal rights. And I would just encourage you to follow the evidence where it leads and be committed to that principle of equality. So thank you all very much. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.